I'm going to speak to you this morning about, um, from the perspective of my research, which I'm a social researcher, looks at the social implications of science and technology and medicine um, at their intersections with issues of race, gender, and class. And I want to offer this morning um, an example that I want to encourage you to think about big data and genetic data in particular. I'm a sociologist of genetics, among other things, um, outside of the kind of categorical and institutional silos that we usually use to think about it. Um, and I think that it brings in doing so is important because we need to think about the particular vulnerabilities of um, certain communities, particularly communities of color, and I want to talk to you about how forms of genetic analysis sort of overlap in ways that we should think about um, in our advocacy, in our policing, and in our research. So generally speaking, there's sort of four categories or, of genetic analysis, uh, medical or clinical, forensic, or criminal justice uses, personal or recreational, and then as a subset of that, we might think about paternity, ancestry, or genealogical testing. And this latter category is what I work on in my research. So you might be familiar with um, medical testing for disease, for predisposition to disease that's used in clinical settings. And this disease can range, from, uh, this kind of use can range from the search for genetic markers for breast cancer, such as the markers that, uh, the BRCA1 and 2 markers that might be familiar with you, to you, and increasing um, genome-wide association studies, which try to really harness tens of thousands of um, individual uh, data points, genetic data, um, to bring us information about patterns of genetic disease amongst individuals, hoping that these large data sets can show us patterns that are not visible from um, more apparent genetic markers. Um, and forensic genetics, um, of course, some of you are familiar with this. We have, for example, um, the, um, the CODIS database, the Combined Data Index System, a subset of which is the, na is the National DNA Index System that are used both municipally um, in the United States and also increasingly internationally. Um, and these tend to be, as you'll understand, you know, reference databases of, um, uh, you know, originally um, the, the DNA of um, people who'd been convicted, but increasingly the DNA of people who've just been arrested and increasingly stopped. Um, and crime scene database data or DNA samples are compared to these databases. So one of the kind of mission creeps of DNA analysis that I want to offer as an example um, is the uh, growing increase in familial searching um, in which um, relatives, so people who are related to people who exist in CODIS and NDIS databases are searched for using genetic samples um, and then are brought into a kind of dra dragnet. Um, the implications of this for black and brown communities that are disproportionately in these databases, not because they're just disproportionately criminal, um, but because of the way that mass incarceration and the carceral state works, um, means that these communities are particularly vulnerable for having relatives to be sort of brought up in this dragnet and it's something that we should uh, keep in mind. And then under the category of um, sort of genealogical um, uh, testing, uh, DNA analysis or personal DNA analysis, um, uh, I want to just introduce a story to you about the ways in which genealogical analysis can sort of spill over into other forms. Many of you are aware of the story of Henrietta Lacks and of the cancer cells that were taken from, uh, her, fa from, her, from her without her family's knowledge or permission and live on today as the HeLa cell line in a lot of laboratories all over the world. What you may not know is well after the story was known in March 2013, a team of scientists sequenced the genome of this um, HeLa cell line and made this for a short period of time, the sequence available online. Um, uh, and, you know, sort of suggesting that they couldn't really infer anything about Henrietta Lacks' genome or descendants from the data that was generated in this study. However, another set of scientists, um, a researcher uploaded he, the HeLa genome data up into Snippedia, which is a kind of wiki-based site of um, genetic markers, and it translated the genetic data about Henrietta Lacks' genome into information about um, physical appearance, genetic predisposition, and, bi and behavioral traits. Um, so the research that was meant to be um, a scientific research and research that was revealing the genome effectively revealed quite a lot, not only about Henrietta Lacks, now deceased, but also about the Lacks family. Indeed, a member of the family objected to the fact that this was private family information um, that was being uh, circulated in the world without their consent. In August of 2013, in an historic agreement, the family reached um, a, a, a sort of um, compromise with the NIH, which restricted um, access to this information, and they have to be, you have to be approved by the family now if you want to use it. Thanks, Dana. 
So what I want to suggest to you is that genetic data is the ultimate big data. Um, that like all data, genetic data can travel very quickly, that data, swaps can, data sets can be swapped between individuals and organizations, but genetic data is also the kind of data that, that provides um, information about different facets of life all at once. So you can get ancestry information, health information, all from a single sample of tissue, blood, or spit. Right? And it can be repurposed for many types, of, um, uh, many types of analysis, whether the original intent is from the criminal justice system or whether it's in a medical or clinical setting or whether one thinks they're doing uh, leisurely work, uh, leisurely hobbyist work around genealogy. So uh, some questions to consider, I think, are how is the data collected and who collected it? Was it collected by a consumer entity or police authority? And what rights and, re and responsibilities come with the way in which the information was collected? Why was it, was it collected and from whom? Um, and in closing, I want to suggest that we need to think about how forms of DNA are categorized. Um, certainly, it makes a difference whether or not someone is using DNA um, analysis in a criminal justice system as opposed to using a test like 23andMe. Um, but I think it's also important that DNA as a data, form of data, really belies these boundaries and, and that in this way, um, DNA is a, a kind of information that it contains information that can be used in a variety of facets of society. In other words, it's multivocal. The same DNA data can be used in lots of different places for lots of different purposes at lots of different times. So I want to suggest to you that we need to attend really to uh, the, this full social life of DNA and our conceptualization of genetic data and policing and our advocacy and as we imagine and create and foster new political and civil rights in this moment. Thank you. Thank you.